So let's start. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today in our first uh, Polarity of Chemistry webinar of 2021. Uh, I am Juan Bernardo Perez. I am a grad student at UC San Diego and I'm honored to be uh, your host today for this webinar. And today our panelist is Professor Felipe Herrera from University of Santiago de Chile. So hello, Professor Felipe Herrera. Hi, Juan. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, before we start the seminar, though, let me share uh, some info. So uh, could you please, Professor Herrera, uh, let me share my screen? Of course. So uh, first of all, I would like to share the results of the uh, uh, Pass the Spotlight uh, uh, opening applications that we did uh, last year. And then uh, so for those who don't know, we basically invite two postdocs, one experimentalist and one theorist. And we, we let the community to select uh, which uh, postdocs they wanna hear in the Polariton Chemistry webinar. And in the experimental side, we will have uh, Dr. Bin Liu. And in the theory side, we will have Dr. Rui Ferreira Silva, da Silva from Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Um, if you wanna, like hear more about uh, our schedule and if you want to be updated on the kind of seminars that we're going to be hosting you can join our polarity and chemistry online community in our facebook group you can also post on that everything that you think is going to be uh, relevant for the community like postdoc uh, applications uh, re recent papers recent uh, findings etc and if you missed the webinar because of time difference or because you're busy at the moment, you can also watch the uh, seminar on our YouTube channel, Polarity and Chemistry Webinars. So please feel free to subscribe. And in terms of the uh, mechanics of the webinar, uh, as an attendee, you have two options. Basically, if you have a question you wanna ask the speaker, you can raise your hand. And then I will interrupt the speaker and I'll, I'll enable your microphone so you can ask the question directly to Professor Herrera. Or if you prefer, you can type the question in the Q&A chat. And then if we have time at the end of the webinar, we can address those questions. And if there is not time, I, uh, Professor Felipe Herrera has, uh, uh, is willing to answer those questions after the webinar is finished, and then we can post the answers to those questions in the commentary section in the YouTube uh, video. So uh, with that mechanics being clear, let me introduce Professor Herrera. Professor Herrera did his bachelor in chemistry from University of San, uh, Santiago de Chile in 2007, and then he moved to the US, uh, to Vancouver, to University of British Columbia to pursue his PhD in theoretical chemistry uh, with Professor Roman Krems. Uh, focusing on studying binary and many body interactions in ultra cold molecular gases. And after obtaining his PhD in 2012, he worked as a postdoc briefly with Professor Saber Kais at Purdue. And then two years at, at Harvard University with Professor Alanis Puruguzic. And after those two years, he was awarded the competitive Kinesi uh, PAI grant to start his current research as a professor at the University of Santiago de Chile, where he's now an assistant professor. Uh, so welcome Professor Felipe Herrera to the Polariton Chemistry webinar and thank you again for accepting our invitation and you can share your screen now. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. Now, um, let me click here, okay. Should we see in my presentation now? Yes. Okay, so great. Well, um, let's go. So thank you for having me today again. And this is, uh, this is work we've done over the past two years since we started paying attention to these um, fantastic experiments on vibration and strong coupling uh, with organic molecules in nanophotonic structures. Uh, we, we think we, uh, we have in this presentation something from everyone, for everyone. We have a little bit of um, experimental descriptions um, for the mathematically oriented. We also have um, um, some theory to discuss. So hopefully you guys will enjoy it. And um, my data is here. You feel free to follow us on Twitter as well so we can continue discussions. 
Now, um, this work is, um, is done at Santiago, as you well said. Now, this particular presentation is about research done by uh, former postdoc Federico Hernandez, who is now the postdoc at um, Queen Mary University in the UK, and um, our current postdoc, Johan Triana, um, who's been with us since 2019. Uh, he's a physicist, and um, we've done uh, we, we published a couple of uh, papers together um, uh, on vibrational strong coupling and ultra strong coupling. And, um, and this is the rest of the group. We do a bunch of stuff. Um, mostly we started doing organic cavity QED for obvious reasons. We started um, thinking about these problems since I was a postdoc and, and, and in Boston. And um, roughly about the same time where these experiments from um, the group of Strasbourg of Thomas Stevenson were coming out in angivante chemie. Then um, here at the SATS, we do other, other things as well, including some legacy projects on neutral cold molecules and atoms. Um, now let's go, to, let's go to the meat of the subject here. Let me hide the controls. Now, um, atomic cavity QD is an old topic. Um, of course, in, in comparison with the rest of physics, this is, uh, this is quite new, but still, um, still the James Cummings model, which describes um, a two-level atom uh, coherently interacting with a quantized electromagnetic field confined by two mirrors, the high quality mirrors, was already there in 1963, okay? And um, so the basic implementations here all right, well, schematically, you have this two-level system that exchanges energy with the uh, cavity field that's confined between the two boundaries, our physical boundaries. They might be, or they may or might not be perfect. And, 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 and this atom can exchange energy with the reservoir uh, by emitting um, fluorescence, basically. If this is a, this is a fluorescing atom, it will, it will leak out uh, photons outside the confined cavity modes. And together, as a coupled entity, the, this uh, system can dissipate energy through the mirrors because the um, reflectivity is not perfect at some rate that we, is, is, is written here as kappa, okay? Two different rates and coupling strengths. Now, this is kind of a um, relatively more, um, it's the same thing, but, um, it's a, but it really uh, identifies the input and output channels for energy, um, um, energy flow in the system. Now, um, these atomic cavity QED experiments are, it can be done very precisely. And um, people can um, select different atomic levels to prepare an atom in, a, in an individual state, in a single state, using sophisticated quantum control techniques. So that, for instance, at some time that we call time t equals zero here, um, you, you have your atom in, a, in an excited level and the cavity in the absolute vacuum. So no cavity photons on it. Now, of course, in, as um, that state is an eigenstate of the uncoupled um, um, Hamiltonians, so to say, of this subpart of the total James Cummings model, but uh, it's not an eigenstate of the entire thing. So because it, once they, these two um, atomic and, and photonic systems are put into contact, they will start interacting and exchanging energy coherently with some, on top of some dissipative processes that occur naturally. And so, so therefore this initial condition where at time t equals zero, you have E zero here as a state will uh, inevitably change in time. These are times in microseconds because these are river levels of an, of, a, of an atom in a high Q cavity here. But at some time um, you, um, the atom will exchange completely its energy, almost completely, with the um, cavity field and create a photon. So you will have now the atom in the ground state at some time later, and, and the cavity will now uh, build up enough energy to create a photon here. Of course, other things happen too, right? But this is mostly what's going on here. Then, um, because the interaction is coherent, the photon will give back the energy to the atom. So you will excite the atom again with, um, with and you have some revival probability that is not fully complete, 
because because uh, also during this period of time there is some probability that the atom will dissipate energy by other in other channels and the photon will leak out through the mirrors okay so after some times you this coherent exchange occurs um, a couple of times in this case maybe about five times and then you lose um, everything you lose the energy here and the signal to noise is it's kind of uh, poor now this um, time domain picture of light matter interaction in this um, in this uh, microwave cavities has a frequency domain um, um, uh, description so the resolution here is not great but basically um, in the frequency domain the signal will give you a, a split um, um, resonance uh, where these two split lines here are separated by a quantity that is proportional to the magnitude of the line matter strength okay this is so-called Rabi splitting okay so these are two things that are intimately related a microscopic term in the Hamiltonian and a, and a frequency shift a frequency splitting that you see in linear spectroscopy now the languages are roughly half the languages uh, half the uh, um, the, the languages of the bare um, atomic and cavity resonances okay this is kind of a hybrid um, language that you that you reach that you achieve in the strong this is the so-called strong coupling regime so with this introduction now we move to nanophotonics now. And, and, and 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 realistic implementations at room temperature which is um, which is a uh, great um, decrease in the overhead for implementing these hamiltonians uh, here you have a pictorial uh, pictorial image of, um, of, a sphere, of a surface, like a metal surface that supports some um, uh, a field confinement um, that um, in, on its surface. So there are many mechanisms for this to happen. In particular, this could be a plasmonic resonance on a very long um, gold and antenna. And here I'm, 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 I'm plotting here, I'm drawing one photon on this uh, near field antenna uh, resonance. Okay, so only one photon that might be resonant with a vibrational mode in a polymer on which you coat, that you use to coat the antenna, okay? So this is, of course, there is no vacuum here. It's just, a, this is a scheme, a schematic picture. Then this vibrational mode can change energy with this photon um, over some time at a rate that's given by this quantity here, G. And, and of course, the vibration is not uncoupled from its environment, right? You have an entire, um, ensemble of uh, polymer nodes that are uh, eager to suck up energy from this vibration and, and as well the photon is not infinitely long lived actually for these metallic antennas it's, it's very short lived this photon will, will leak out from this antenna in only a few tens of femtoseconds but still um, um, under, um, it is possible under some circumstances to, um, to, to make things match in a way that um, these two resonances photonic and material can couple strongly okay now um if we if we analyze the crossover from the so-called weak coupling regime of cavity qd to the strong coupling regime i i think we one way to look at this is in the time domain and uh, in the time domain there is a there is a sweet spot here that is given by this ratio being equal to unity where a square root of ng is kind of a, the magnitude of the collective coupling between the vibrations in the material and the and the and the cavity field, effective cavity field, and the and the and decay mismatch. So um, of course this cannot be equal. Typically, it's never equal. Right? Otherwise, this will diverge. But um, for real systems, kappa is always much larger than gamma, at, at least a few times um, in nanophotonics, at least. Um, so in that in that scenario where kappa over gamma is large. Then what you expect is that the T2 time for a vibrational coherence uh, becomes much suppressed as you increase the line matter coupling strength. This is a Purcell effect, okay? And then you have different experiments. Um, the references for these are not here, but I can provide, of course. Then, then if kappa over gamma is order 30, for instance, is, as you increase this ratio, then you reach a regime where both the um, vibrational and T2 time and the photonic T2 time kind of merge into a single hybrid um, um, decay time. And this uh, hybrid decay time is nothing more than uh, kappa plus gamma divided by two. This is an ideal picture of homogeneous uh, line matter uh, couple systems. Okay. And there are many implementations that have already reached this um, strong coupling regime um, with parameters like this, this, this two are experiments in, in 
Fabry Perot micro cavities in the uh, uh, tens of uh, uh, microns long. Okay, these are liquid phase um, uh, infrared cavities. These are more recent experiments with, uh, for instance, with um, um, hexagonal boron nitride nanostructures um, that are also uh, roughly um, a little bit below the uh, Fabry Perot cavities, but are very well in the strong coupling regime. And these are nanophotonic scenarios where you have also local control over the, um, the light matter couple system with a tip. Okay, and um, so this is where we are. And there, there, to, to our um, theoretical uh, pleasure, we have um, a, a great deal of implementations to look up. Okay, and we have liquid phase cavities with values of G and kappa that are uh, given here. We have um, also liquid phase cavities where you achieve strong coupling with the solvent. I will describe more about that in a few slides. We have slightly larger because if the solvent has a large number of uh, uh, molecules per unit volume, you have larger values of N and that gives you larger Gs with roughly the same kappas here. Um, and, and of course in nanophotonics you have different things. You, have, you can have very strong coupling because it's a very strong field confinement, but the, the photons can leak out also very rapidly. It, nevertheless, you can still see um, um, and rabbit splittings in the frequency domain. Okay, and these are these are the recent experiments on hexagonal boron nitro nano ribbons coated with a with a semiconductor organic semiconductor. The Gs and kappas are smaller, but they are similar, so they they still achieve strong coupling. So it's not the the absolute size, but the comparison. Okay, that matters. Now um, this talk is about chemistry and spectroscopy. So let me. Um, refresh to students and, and also non-experts, what, what is the motivation uh, here for most of us theories is to understand what's going on here. So we have this um, cavity-free solvolysis of uh, PMPA, paranito uh, phenyl acetate, which is, um, is used in chemistry for various um, um, purposes. It's a, it's, a, it's a nucleophilic substitution. So you have, you have a mildly acidic um, molly, um, basic, but um, um, you have a, um, a nucleophile in the solvent. So a fluorine atom. Um, and, that, um, and that solvent, when this reaction happens in ethyl in, in acetate, which is a polar solvent, um, you activate the one atom, one carbon atom here in this carbonyl group, okay? And that, um, so the, the, the fluorine atom enters a gear here, attacks the carbon nucleus and, and chemistry happens. So chemi chemistry happens means that uh, you break a bond. Okay, so you break a bond. So the uh, fluorine atom goes with, the oxygen goes with the fluorine here and, and you leave a bare oxygen um, atom here with some excess charge. So you have this ion PMP minus ion and, and everything here has a UV absorption spectrum, so you can track the process of this reaction as, P, as PMP minus is produced, okay, by looking at the UV absorption spectrum of these species. Now, everything is done uh, as in standard chemistry, like in a beaker, and, and, and this is done in, in, in ethyl acetate, which is a good, um, maybe like a, like a weak Lewis catalyst for this particular reaction and ethyl acetate is a polar solvent with uh, almost a 1.9 divide of dipole moment at equilibrium. What's, uh, that's not very surprising. This is uh, 100 years old of chemistry. Uh, people know what to do. Chemists are incredibly, in, in, in incredibly creative to, um, to get this done. So one of the testaments of their creativity is this particular experiment from um, last year, in which um, you place this reaction inside a cavity Okay, an infrared cavity, and you um, build the cavity so that the uh, um, one of the higher order modes of this Fabry Perot structure, in particular this tenth mode, is resonant with the carbonyl absorption uh, peak, which is very strong, um, and, uh, from the solvent. So you don't even target the reactants now. You target the solvent, and and of course because the solvent density is much larger than the dilute reactant. You, uh, PMPA is in the weak coupling regime as mo at the most. Okay, so you can only at most expect some for sale enhancement of IVR, uh, but, uh, but not strong coupling at all. And then yet, um, you, you, the people have measured here, the group of Thomas Everson 
and Gino George. Um, actually, these experiments were done in India, as far as I understand. The, um, they, um, they, they measure these huge rate enhancements. I mean, huge meaning that is, is significant, okay? And so it's significant. And so it's a catalyst. This, this entire system acts as a catalyst. If you somehow activate even further this carbonyl uh, uh, bond from the solvent, okay? So this entire reaction is faster. And if um, this is a resonant effect, because if you, if you bring the carbonyl out of resonance by changing it, the mass of the carbon atom, then uh, you, you see no effect. Um, as a theorist, um, we were extremely excited. I think we, we had a huge celebration for maybe two days when we saw this paper out because it, it, it gives us work for a couple of years, basically, to try to figure out what's going on. And um, so that's chemistry. That's a challenge for chemistry. So then there are also challenges in spectroscopy. These uh, people have done spectroscopy on, on infrared cavities uh, for some time now, and we have leading experiments from the group of UCSD, um, from Wei Xiong, and, and, and these, are, these are beautiful um, 2 D IR um, um, experiments that, um, that leverage everything we understand about 2D spectroscopy in, in, in cavity-free environments and in cavity-free systems. With, uh, but now we have to deal with uh, hybrid light matter states and their um, uh, relaxation processes, which we don't quite understand well yet. But we are, um, we are, we are making progress in that direction. So you have, you can do to the IR uh, spectroscopy on the cavity. You can measure, um, of course, polariton uh, splittings, but you can do more than that. You can observe uh, coherent transients um, uh, between different polariton states and also uh, sometimes new um, transitions that um, you can expect to observe that probe even higher polaritonic levels, okay? Now, linear spectroscopy is well understood, and in this is a particular um, linear transmission spectrum of, um, of sodium nitroprosite. On, it's an experiment that we'll, I will discuss in, in just a few seconds. Now, this is uh, sodium nitroprosite in a, in a fabry perot IR cavity, and these are um, 2D IR experiments done by the groups of uh, Jeff Rotsky, Blake Simkins, and Adam Dankelberger at the uh, US Naval Research Lab. And, and, and this is one of the results in the, the references here. Um, one of the results they obtained is that they produce this uh, solution with uh, N S SMP, which is also a polar molecule, um, and they couple to the NO bond of uh, sodium nitroprosite, which is a non-degenerate vibration. And, and they, um, they measure the response of the system or the 2 IR, uh, 2D IR uh, spectra of the system at different pulse delays with the hope of trying to understand how are the relaxation processes happening in this uh, complex scenario. Well, how much of the relaxation is polaritonic how much is bare molecular relaxation or, or pure photonic? Okay, this is, this is kind of the big question here. Now, to their surprise, um, um, some years ago, they had this data in which at, um, of, at early times, early delays between the pump and the probe, then they observe uh, some negative features at the projections of the 2 d IR spectra when you pump the upper polariton states, okay, the upper polariton frequencies. And also you have the, the certain negative features um, at the lower polariton, uh, in the lower polariton range, but they could account for them. They could still account for them with, um, with some classical modeling or some previous models that they have developed with other collaborators. But, uh, but these negative features here at the early times that emerge when they pump at the upper polariton level in linear transmission, then they could not account for. Um, so, so they, they, they came up with a question of um, the, whether we could say something about it. And um, of course, it was very confusing because these negative features disappear rapidly. Okay, so and the, some of it, some of it uh, it's still there, uh, 10 picoseconds, where you expect, um, we expect that and, and roughly two lifetimes, two bare lifetimes have already occurred. And then a 50 picoseconds delay, you, they only observe basically the um, uh, bare reservoir response. 
So um, all the polaritonic effects have already disappeared. Of course, everything I say is, 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 is very rough. You should really ask them for all the details here. And, um, but, uh, but one thing to keep in mind is that these negative features show up because they, they, they are associated with increased transmission. This is a transmission setup. So they, they, the cavity transmits more when you pump at the UP and then probe, uh, probe near the UP as well. So around that region. And so the, the um, pro field is transmitted more, and that's why you have this negative peak, okay, in this, um, in this uh, choice of units. And um, so we, um, in the rest of the talk, I would try to explain how we came up with this peak assignment, okay? So it turns out that for short time delays, you can uh, rationalize their, these negative features in terms of, um, Polariton to polariton transitions. So in, in free space, it will be like an excited state absorption feature in, 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 in the pump pro spectroscopy. But here's a transmissive geometry, so it's kind of different. But conceptually, it's the same. And technically, it's different. So if, um, if they pump at the UP, then we, we understand this negative feature as an additional absorption or additional transmission resonance. To, to another higher upper polariton in, in a second excited manifold that is, is where you expect to have the V equals two resonance in free space, but not quite at the same frequency. So uh, these particular values here are results of a model that we'll explain in a minute. Um, okay, so Juan, how are we doing with times? I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, it's yeah, two, yeah. Two. so far we're good, yes. Okay. Um, so, um, what's the model? Okay, this is, these are the references for the, the we're publishing JCP, and uh, which is publishing a lot of theory work in this field with Johan Trian and Federico Hernandez. And um, the first thing to um, come back to our um, basic quantum mechanical um, courses of physical chemistry or of the Mars potential. So, what is the Mars potential? Is really the workhorse of all of uh, molecular dynamics, really. And uh, of course, energy um, and, and all parameterizable potentials are important, but uh, the Morse potential is, is, is quite underst well understood. So you have, as a comparison, this is from Wikipedia, as a comparison from a harmonic oscillator and a Mars oscillator, the, the key thing to understand is, of course, the anharmonicity in the, spec in, the, um, in the energy levels so, um, and the energy level spacing decreases as you go high in energy and the Mars potential can dissociate unlike the harmonic oscillator, okay? Of course, um, in linear spectroscopy, you only probe the lower parts of these potentials. So the, um, um, you basically cannot distinguish between a Mars potential and an harmonic oscillator if you only do linear spectroscopy. This of course, take it with a grain of salt because you also have, um, you have overtones and all, all the complexities that, of course, are, are always there for real molecules, real vibrations. So the Mars potential has breaks parity in this sense that it has no infrared absorption selection rules. So you have delta nu could be anything except zero, of course, and and you have some photo dissociation. Then the, it's well understood that the limits for photo dissociation of a Mars potential is really the anharmonic blockade. If we shine a, a monochromatic laser here eventually this laser will, will not um, 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 make the vibrations to uh, scale up any, any farther in energy because the laser is farther tuned from these transitions. Okay, so we have some anharmonic blockade that kind of limits the efficiency of um, monochromatic photo dissociation. That's why people came up with chirp um, pulses to solve that problem. Um, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, now, if we put this Mars potential in a cavity, the first question you ask, even before writing the, the first line of code, is what is the association energy? Because when, once you place these Mars oscillators in a cavity, then basically every Mars potential is dressed by a cavity photon state. And if you choose, a, if you adopt the Fock state basis for your cavity field, then basically you have replicas of the Mars potential for every photon number. And, and there is no limit here. Okay, the, the cavity is really an harmonic oscillator, has no bound, upper bound. Okay, and uh, so where is the dissociation threshold? 
And the answer we understand now is that it depends on the state of the field. So we have a, um, a field uh, state dependent dissociation energy that you need to find out what it is. And this is kind of an open um, topic here um, that we hope to be able to address. We have only have partial answers in this, um, in this sense. Now, if we want to understand how does the coupling scheme works for this uh, Mars potential in a, in, in a cavity, then we can identify um, the, the, the coupling structure for lower levels. And in particular, we can have, um, we only care about three replicas for the vacuum, for the N equals one Fox state and N equals two Fox state. And if you do that, and the, the frequency of the cavity is resonant with the zero one um, um, vibration and frequency, which is the fundamental in IR spectroscopy, then, then you have these degeneracies here. You have um, uh, two states that are quasi degenerate here that has one photon or one vibrational excitation. And then you have three states that are quasi degenerate um, at the second vibrational level here. We have two, either two vibrational excitations, one vibrational excitation and one photon or zero vibrational excitations and two photons. And they cannot couple to each other um, through D dot E. Of course, if you, if you adopt a different coupling model, there will be different selection rules, but at the level of D dot E, which is dipolar coupling, which I believe is important and relevant, you can really understand uh, what, is, um, um, what is the level diagram that is important for spectroscopy. So for instance, the, in linear transmission, you observe this, um, uh, these peaks here. Now, um, what we think is relevant for chemistry, what happens at higher energies, okay? So if we have um, um, a larger number of replicas or your cavity can somehow build up photon amplitude, with in this particular case up to n equals six, then you have a, 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 lar a larger density of levels are, are quasi degenerate within a detuning here. And the, the relative contribution of all these different vibrations and photon states uh, will depend on the details of the molecular dipole moment. Okay, this is uh, something we understand now. And in particular, if we, for our, uh, uh, if we ask a simple question, what's the bond length of a uh, Mars oscillator in a cavity? Then we can compute the, the bond length. So the mean value of the distance between the two nuclei in a, in a, in a, in a Mars oscillator as a function of the energy of uh, polaritonic stationary states. For this is a value of line matter coupling that is kind of at the onset of ultra strong coupling. This is G over omega equals 2.1. And the coupling is resonant, okay? The, uh, with the fundamental vibrational frequency. Now you see that um, we plot here the um, mean bond distance of the Mars levels outside the cavity. These are the uh, um, empty symbols here. And of course, as you reach the energy for dissociation, the, the bond separates, the enlarges and eventually breaks, right? This is what you expect in free space. So look at what happens inside the cavity. You, you, because of these couplings, you always have some contributions of lower vibrational uh, states, even at high energies, because of this hierarchy of, um, um, of uh, couplings with large density, large number of levels and avoided crossings here that will occur. So even beyond the dissociation threshold, um, um, even five times a vibrational quanta above the dissociation threshold, you still have polaritonic states that are uh, very much bound. So this bond uh, doesn't look like it wants to break, even if you pump up energy um, um, way beyond what you, would, what you would need in free space, okay? And now this is true, we found out this a couple, a couple of years ago, and this is true actually for non-polar vibrations. If we believe it's general, uh, we, this, we call it a bond hardening effect, and we believe it's general only for polar, uh, for non-polar vibrations. And we, we were very pleased to see this very recent work from the group of uh, um, uh, Angel Rubio in Germany, we, who using a, a, a somehow different line coupling model, um, they also see the same things for a non-polar H2 plus molecule in a cavity, okay? So um, what, what this happens is this is, uh, this is the bond distance basically, it's the same plot that we had before. This is the bond distance and uh, you see the bond distance increasing as you increase the energy. And, and this green line here represents the free space association threshold. So the bond separates, breaks, okay? But, um, but if you put this into a cavity, 
you still have that at energies that are exceed that exceed the dissociation threshold, you still have polaritonic states that are very much bound. So you have bound states in the in the free space continuum. And um, so that's great. And this is something to be tested in experiments. And uh, um, we would like to discuss that with colleagues. Now, um, the model, we, we need to discuss the details of the model, of course, show a Hamiltonian for a theory talk. And, and this is the simpler, uh, uh, simplest way to write down the Hamiltonian, okay? In, in we project the line matter coupling um, in a multipolar form uh, over a vibrational, complete vibrational basis, which in principle should include also states in the continuum. And we do actually in numerics, but um, we can represent this as a discrete level here. We can always quantize the continuum in a box and have discrete momentum states. Um, but um, what's important here is that you have, of course, a free cavity Hamiltonian. So it's an harmonic oscillator. You have the Morse spectrum here. So um, the, uh, the Morse potential has, has eigenstates that we can compute them and have their energies and their wave functions. And we can project d dot e in this Morse eigenstate basis and have, um, and have this form here. This uh, summation is over all um, um, line matter coupling terms that, um, that, re that are represent transition dipole moments. We have d dot e, but we have d dot e with transition dipoles in between the couple different vibrational levels and also permanent dipole moments, which um, we don't couple different vibrational levels but they are still there, okay? They also couple to light, okay? Now, epsilon, this epsilon zero here, this curly epsilon is really, the, the square of that is a magnitude of the vacuum fluctuations, which represents a, how confined your cavity field is, okay? Now, um, the, this dipole moment is not, in, unlike atoms, this is not um, um, like a um, um, finite rank matrix, okay? This is an expansion of, um, uh, of the electric di dipole moment density over the nuclear displacements. This is for Oppenheimer approximation, and you can expand to as many terms as you need. And if you want to understand only the fundamental absorption frequencies, then you care about the slope of this dipole moment as you, as you um, um, depart the nuclear configuration from equilibrium, then overtones are given by the square um, um, by Q squares here, terms here, quadratic, um, and harmonicities in the dipole function, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, of course, the overtones, here is an example of uh, CO2 in, in ice. This is an astrophysical, this is astrophysical data. And, and of course, the, these overtones, you have a fundamental heat of an asymmetric stretch and at twice the frequency, you have an overtone resonance. What's important is that the overtones are very weak. In this particular case, it's, uh, it's enhanced by, by the presence of water in ice, but still ten, at least 10 times an order of magnitude weaker than the fundamental, okay? We still take it into account. We don't neglect um, um, poor um, contributions here. And we do that because we want to understand differences um, between different classes of molecules. And we identify at least three classes that we call um, according to the shape of the dipole moment function near the equilibrium configuration. So now in this particular example, the equilibrium configuration is at Q equals four um, um, uh, Bohr radius, okay? And, uh, or atomic units. And then um, we have something that we call polar left molecule, which is in sodium nitrate peroxide is an example of it, where um, the, the bond has to shrink in order for the dipole to grow, okay? If, they, if the bond lengthens, the dipole moment, the electric dipole moment decreases. So we call that a polar left. So it has a negative slope at the equilibrium. And in the opposite side, we have polar right. A polar right, like um, uh, HF, for instance. So, so you have to lengthen the bond in order for the dipole moment to increase. Or we have um, um, iron pentacarbonyl, which is non-polar at equilibrium because all the uh, carbonyl ligands are, uh, are at symmetric positions here. So it has zero dipole moment at equilibrium but if you, if you move the carbonyl bonds in a certain, in any direction, then the bond increases or decreases depending whether you shrink or, um, or, um, or uh, lengthen the bonds, okay? So, and then here we plot the corresponding transition dipole moments in red and permanent dipole moments uh, for every vibrational level here in, in black circles. 
Now, if you only look at the transition dipole moments, then you will see that all these molecules will have, if they have the same fundamental frequency, they will have roughly the same IR spectra because you have a strong from them, um, zero to one absorption peak and then a weak first overtone. And that's roughly what happens with all of them. Okay. So you should not be able to distinguish if they happen to have the same vibrational frequencies, you will not be able to distinguish them by their dipole moments functions in free space. However, in a cavity, the situation is, is entirely different. It's entirely different. So you have, for instance, for polar right species, and um, we, the model predicts, of course, this is, um, this is a spectrum for the polariton states up to um, about 2.5 times the vibrational, the very vibrational um, uh, transition frequency. Um, then you have, um, you have as a function of G over omega C, which is the magnitude of the line matter coupling strength. So G is D dot E with the transition dipole between zero and one, okay, vibrational levels. And um, so here you have a um, Ravi coupling of 10%, the, um, the cavity frequency. And, and from this is the conventional ultra strong coupling crossover, which is completely arbitrary, of course. And then everything beyond that is deep in the ultra strong coupling regime. Okay. Now, experiments mostly are here, some of them are here. Now, um, of course, if you have a ground state, everything here is normalized to the ground state energy. I will tell you in a minute why we do that. But in this, in this energy scale, the ground state doesn't move, okay? But um, then you have a, a, a lower and upper polariton resonance in linear transmission, and then you have the triplet um, in the second excitation manifold. But as you, if you increase the line matter coupling strength, you have this huge number of avoided crossings uh, that occur because, um, because all these vibrational levels and the, and the, and the Fox states, they heavily admixed. Now, um, here we compare the calculation of the spectrum if we include the entire dipole matrix, both permanent and, 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 and transition dipoles, versus considering only transition dipole moments, so completely ignoring the, permanent, the contribution of permanent dipole moments. And we, see, we don't see much differences at, at, at small values of g over omega, but already, already like at moderate values of this ratio, of closer, even below 0.1, we still see significant differences, especially if we convert this into wave numbers. We, we can still see differences in the peak positions, for instance, that are at least three or four times the language. Okay, so if you really wanna do accurate uh, comparison with experiments, you do need to take into account the transition dipole moments. This is our uh, understanding. We might be wrong, of course, but uh, so far I think the experiments are uh, in agreement with this. Now, um, this, is, this is about the spectrum. Now, what about the chemistry here? Yeah. So look at the ground state bond distance. So I, I take the ground state eigenstate of the polariton Hamiltonian as a function of the line matter coupling strength, and I compute the, the length of the bond, okay? And, and we see that if we don't include um, um, permanent dipole moments, we should expect to see no difference in the bond length from the no equals zero um, um, level here in free space, except at these very high energies that, um, that are, are due completely attributed to the ultra strong coupling, deep in the ultra strong coupling regime, we should still see uh, changes in the mean value of Q, even without permanent dipoles. But that's not the point. The point is that you need to include both transition and permanent dipoles to predict that the ground state will soften, okay, for a polar right species which is HF, for instance, and um, you, the, the, naturally, just spontaneously, the, the, the equilibrium bond length will not be the same as the ground state vibration. It will be longer. So the bond will be more susceptible to undergo chemistry. And, um, and in, in, in addition to that, the cavity field experiences changes as well. So um, the, you have a photon buildup in the cavity, bare photon, of course, a dagger A is not um, a, a good quantum number uh, operator anymore, but it does commute with part of the Hamiltonian at least. But we, we can still ask what's a bare number of photons here. And, and, and we see a huge increase, right? Especially we already see that the ground state has um, a mean value of N of about 0.1. So it's not, it's not zero. You do have some photons there, 
even in the ground state. And this is not surprising. This is very well understood in the ultra strong coupling um, uh, literature for, for atoms and superconducting circuits. Um, we can do dynamics. So now that we understand the static properties, we can, we can try to anticipate what to expect from, uh, from the evolution of uh, this line matter couple state under, under specific initial conditions. So what the initial condition here is that we start from a, a ground state um, vibration, no equals zero, and a, and a cavity vacuum, n equals zero. Okay, that's the initial condition here, but the coupling strength is relatively large. Okay, so this initial state zero, zero is not an eigenstate at these values of g over omega. So we expect that this state will evolve as a polariton wave packet. Okay, and then we can ask what is the mean bond distance and the mean photon number of this wave packet, and, and this is the result. So if we have nonpolar molecules, we roughly observe what we expect. Okay, so for instance, if we start from nu equals zero, then after some time, we go to nu equals one, and that's expected because this, this cavity is resonant with the zero one absorption peak. And the cavity in this particular case, sorry, I have to correct myself. This is a, this is a different initial condition. This is a coherent state with a mean value of n equals two. Okay, so what happens here is that uh, after the same time in which the, the molecule is excited, the, um, the cavity the, uh, loses a photon. So you, ha you have kind of this resonant behavior in which the cavity gives out energy to the uh, molecular transition and vice versa. Okay, of course, there's more to that in this scenario, but over 150 femtoseconds, this is what you expect for a nonpolar molecule. And, and then if you, if you go to a polarized species, a polarized species behaves differently. And we have the same initial condition here. So we have um, a coherent state with two photons on it in the cavity initially. And then these two photons will turn into roughly four after the same, in the same period. So you will increase the number of photons in the cavity and the uh, no equals zero um, uh, bond distance will increase over the same time period to no equals three. So both the cavity and the vibration become excited when the molecule is polar. How is this happening? This, this, is, this should be breaking um, energy conservation. And this is the comment we got uh, once, but um, then what you forget to recall is that uh, the initial state is not an eigenstate of the system. It's actually a very excited wave packet. And so we do expect to see that this wave packet naturally finds itself uh, jumping back and forth in these polaritonic potentials uh, so that in, in the course of the evolution, both the mean value of N and the mean value of Q grow. Okay. Now, um, we have then two behaviors to compare, bond hardening versus bond softening. Now, um, uh, both molecules are polar now, but one is polar right and the other is polar left. Okay, and they have roughly the same permanent dipole moment and equilibrium. And they're both placed in an empty cavity in the ground level at t equals zero. Okay, then what you see here is that the polar left molecule actually compresses. So um, if, if you start from v equals zero uh, mean bond distance and relevant or associately associated with the ground vibration level, you even you even shrink a little bit. Okay, not that much, but you don't enlarge the the bond doesn't enlarge itself. However, for the polar right species, you, um, and for this value of the coupling strength, you exaggerate the enlargement of the bond. So you go to over 300 femtoseconds to bond lengths that are comparable with nu equals eight in free space. So you, in, in other words, you kind of, if you, if you stick with the potential picture, which is wrong in this case, with the Morse potential picture, you kind of climb the Morse potential all the way up to nu equals eight. Okay, and, and, and how about the photon number? And again, so if you, if you start in this particular case, again, I, I have to correct myself. You don't start with the vacuum. You start with uh, no equals two, uh, with n equals two. We have some uh, small number of photons in the cavity to begin with. Then um, the point here is that even this small number of photons become even smaller. Okay, you actually, you contract in the, in, in the Fox space. So you go closer to the vacuum. If you start outside the vacuum, you go closer to the vacuum in phase space, if, you, if your molecule is polar left. And, 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 but if your molecule is polar right, if you start 
a little bit away from the vacuum, we have an average of two photons only in this cavity field initially. Then you move away from the vacuum even more. So you build up only up to eight photons on average. Okay, so this is a, this is a displacement effect that the polar molecule is inducing on the cavity field. And of course, as you displace the cavity, you create photons on it. If you stick to the bare picture, once you have photons inside the cavity, build up naturally, because in this way packet evolution, then these photons will interact back with the Morse oscillator and, and, and undergo the vibration and ladder climbing as you would um, in free space. So it's kind of a self-excitation effect here, which I think is fantastic. Now, this is all nice, but uh, I told you there was something for everyone. So it, and let me recall this Richard Feynman quote. So it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. We truly believe this, actually. And uh, so we need to test the model. And we, we are thankful for um, uh, Blake and Jeff, who actually uh, showed us their data and, and gave us a try. So we did. And we, we only asked for two sets of inputs. One is we needed the transition frequencies in free space and the transition dipole moments from IR spectroscopy in a relevant solvent, okay? Now two, we need the um, 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 stationary polariton splitting in, the, in, the, in linear spectroscopy. In this particular case, it's 46.5 wave numbers. Now sodium nitroprosite is a polar left molecule. And, and with this input, we give predictions, okay? And of course, after some parsing of the, of the theory here, or some fitting to actually match this uh, fitting of the model, so especially the dipole moment function to match this uh, column here and to match this value as much as possible, then we predict the position of the absorption lines in the, in the PAM Pro spectra. And, and the agreement is, is fantastic. We were surprised actually. Um, we, the, the theory, in particular, these uh, lines here are predictions. We didn't know what to expect from them. We just plug in the input, um, enter the data into the theory, diagonalize up to the second excitation manifold, and this is what you get. And uh, the, the predictions do differ from experiments in, in, in several ways. First, they cannot, they cannot uh, measure any, anything here because of spectral um, uh, congestion. So we, we help with different samples, this will be resolved. But then the model predicts that, uh, for instance, from an hour polariton peak that you populate in the pump after pumping with a resonant field here, then we predict two possible transitions, one to, from the UP1 to UP2, and one from UP1 to MP2. And we predict the uh, UP1 to UP2 to be stronger than, than, than the other one. And in experiments, it's the opposite. Okay, so there is, there is a lot about um, higher excitation manifold that we still don't understand. We think it has to do with inhomogeneous broadening because a static disorder will of course change this homogeneous Hamiltonian and will, will suppress the photonic contribution from states that otherwise will be more photonic than, um, um, than, in, than what experiments are telling us. So because the strength of these peaks roughly goes like the square of the uh, photonic contribution of the polariton states, okay? Now, uh, this is about spectroscopy. Now we have, we have results about chemistry too. And this is, this is roughly anticipated a few minutes ago and on uh, something we call self dissociation. Yeah. I'm sorry, so sorry professor. Time? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. professor, it's 9.54, but I interrupted you because there is two questions. Uh, yeah. So, Joel. Hi, uh, this is a very nice result. Can, can, can you go back to, to the previous slide, please? Uh, yeah, so can you explain again, um, based on this type of, uh, say, the second excitation manifold transitions, how can I distinguish between a left polar molecule, a right uh, polar molecule, and the one that is non-polar, like uh, what are the qualitative features in this type of spectra that allow me to make those distinctions? We can't at the moment. Okay. We can't. It's, uh, it's, um, there, will be, there will be a polar, in other words, there will be a polar left 
molecule that might have similar spectral positions. It all depends on the details of the dipole function. We don't see, we're not measuring bone lengths or photon numbers. We're only measuring uh, peak positions. Okay. It just happens that this particular molecule is polar left, but um, I can always find a polar right molecule with the same table here. But, and that will necessarily generate the same seven levels, right? Is in the polar. It will generate, exactly. It will generate the same number of levels. Now, what we could then check, we could check if whether there are um, um, mismatches between the uh, peak positions, but then uh, we are making so many errors here. We're neglecting inhomogeneous broadening um, and any other photonic effect that might shift the peaks. Okay, uh, and, uh, okay, this is interesting. And uh, I guess the other question I have is, we also have a very similar set of levels, but for the multi, for the many molecule case. And I was wondering if you know what are the differences in, um, these are the bright states of the many molecule case. And, That's right. Uh, we're wondering if you know what is the difference between the peak positions uh, of this single molecule uh, model with respect to the many molecule one. Okay, so the, the value of the peak positions is given by, this is collective Ravi coupling. Yes. So at the, at the level of the bright manifold, do we replace G by square root of NG? And that's and, allowed. And, and, that's that's allowed. It. and the rest is all the same, right? Or, exactly. Or, or are there any differences with respect to the many molecule case? If in the homogeneous, in the homogeneous uh, model that we have, we, there should be no differences. That's what I mean when, uh, if you take into account the fact that the vibrational resonances for each individual molecule in this assembly is not the same, there is a Gaussian distribution of them. Then, then you expect the dark, this dark reservoir at the V equals one and V equals two energy levels um, to mix differently with the bright states. Okay. And, I, I, and I that will lead to differences. Uh, sorry, and I guess the last question I want to ask, uh, okay, I, I, I'm wondering if you agree with the following statement that I'm going to make. So all these statements about bond hardening will be true in the single molecule case, but in the collective regime, they average out and they give rise to no changes in the bond strength of the ensemble. Would you agree with that statement or at, not? At, in the long time, in the long time scales, I would agree. However, think about this. Um, you need to overcome an energy barrier to undergo chemistry. Okay. So only those states that take you um, up close to the um, activation energy threshold only those states will undergo chemistry efficiently. Everything else, everything else with, uh, will basically remain at the top of, bottom of the reactant well. Now, um, think about this um, bond softening effect, for instance, that where you have, because of the bipolar nature of the molecules, even in the collective regime, only a subset of polaritonic levels will overcome the energy barrier, even if the number of states is much, smart, much smaller than the Bell Reservoir. So the Bell Reservoir will undergo free space chemistry, is not subject to the bond softening or bond hardening effects, but only a few states, a few levels in comparison in, the, in, in, in number density of states will, uh, will experience this phenomenon and will reach the activation very faster. Okay, that's very and, interesting. And therefore affect so basically you're saying that you will see in the collective regime, you will see an effect for the bond softening case, but not for the bond hardening case. Bond hardening will take you even deeper in the reactant well. Yeah, exactly. So then there will be no changes in the reactivity that are measurable uh, in the thermal activity regime. That's, would... that's what I understand so far. And of but... course, this is neglecting tunneling or whether, whether the product and the reactant are coupled by the cavity. This is entirely different. So this is so new. And there's so many open windows here that um, it, everything could be happening simultaneously. But at least if we ignore all these other quantum effects that could be there, of course, um, uh, only, the, only by taking into account that the, um, uh, and the, the vibrational levels in the reactant will made self-excite in, in, if the coupling, light matter coupling is strong enough, only for those polaritonic states that reach up faster than the rest 
um, to the activation barrier will contribute to a small enhancement of the chemistry. Now, if, everything, if all the chemistry happens through polariton states, then you will see orders of magnitude enhancements. But we only see factors of two at the most, right? Yeah. And um, but that's why you have on, on the average rate is an ensemble uh, measurement, right? So you have to take into account all the processes in the dark manifolds, all the processes in the polariton manifolds. And the, the, the mechanism we're describing here is only valid for the polaritonic states that are completely um, uh, permutational invariant. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. So I think uh, I got the message that we're over time, right? Yes. Uh can, can, can we allow two more questions uh, before uh, you continue? Uh, how, how much? How many slides do you have left? I have. Uh, I, I can. I can finish in two minutes. Okay. So, so why don't we finish and then we can go to the questions? Maybe I think it's. Yeah. Okay. Easy. Great. So, um, so we have now um, self dissociation of HF. Okay. HF is described here. Twenty two bound states, six point zero three electron volts dissociation energy, you, and it's a polarized molecule. So you put this into a cavity and we have the following experiments. So at time, at the early time, at the early time, you have a B equals zero HF outside the cavity and a cavity without photons on it. So G equals zero, no coupling, of course. Um, the two systems are separated physically even, okay? Now, um, now you, you bring it very fast, the, you bring the molecule, the ground state molecule very fast into the cavity and you start the clock. So this is t equals zero and, and, and the dipole and the cavity confinement is such that G over omega is large actually. It's in the ultra strong capturing regime. So it's a completely, it's an entirely non um, um state preparation scheme. So it's a quench. Now, how does the system evolve? And now we, we predict here the association probabilities for this initial state of up to 20% uh, when the cavity is initially in the absolute vacuum, if the cavity is somehow under the influence of thermal light, let's say you have a UV lamp. A UV lamp, of course, has a peak maximum in the UV, but it's the, the effective temperature is 1,000 Kelvin. So a black body of 1,000 Kelvin also has some contribution in the infrared, right, of photons. So if you put this in thermal contact with a, with a source of 1,000 Kelvin or so, then you have the mean number of photons in the cavity initially is even non-zero. And in that case, you, 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 you enhance the association by a bit, okay? And here we compare with a laser, just, just for our um, uh, uh, curiosity. So if we shine a laser now outside the cavity, this is free space HF in B equals zero, shine it with a laser that um, is 2.8 times 10 to the 14 watts per centimeter square, um, you still don't ionize the molecule at these intensities. And, and then uh, this is monochromatic at the same uh, fundamental frequency. And then uh, you also dissociate the molecule with, uh, with more efficiently, but uh, uh, it happens slightly slower, but you still do it more efficiently. And, and then you, you, reach a, uh, you reach a bound in the dissociation um, efficiency due to the anemone blockade. You cannot overcome, so you cannot do better than 40% with a laser at this particular frequency. Of course, people do better by chirping the lasers, et cetera. This is a completely different story. Now, um, we understand the mechanism for this. And with this, I will finish, I think. Um, the mechanism is entirely due to uh, um, dipole-induced displacement of the cavity field. So now, if the total Hamiltonian, we suppress the transition dipole moments, only take into account the permanent dipole moments. So there is no coupling between vibration and levels. Only, only permanent dipoles coupled to light. If we do that, then, um, then we can solve this analytically. It's just a displaced oscillator for the cavity field. And the ground state energy now, without transition dipole moments, scales like, uh, like the D dot E, but with the permanent dipole, squared divided by omega, okay? So it square, scales quadratically with the field confinement strength. So it's proportional to directly to the vacuum fluctuations and not the square root of it. And, and so now, of course, the ground state is not, it doesn't have zero photons. It's a, it's a displaced um, oscillator. Um, and, and here we compare the ground state energy, which is formally is really a block secret shift here when I'm plotting. And the ground state energy as a function of G over omega, but G, take, G defined with, in terms of the transition dipole moment, of course. And if we take the entire Hamiltonian with H1 and H2, then we get the blue line. 
if we have only the permanent dipole moments, so this Hamiltonian, then we have that the ground state scales quadratically with this quantity here with the um, vacuum amplitude. And, and we see that already for moderate values of G over omega, you have ground state shifts that are comparable with the dissociation energy. So when you put in here, um, for this value of G, when you place zero, 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 zero is actually a highly excited wave packet, polariton wave packet. And that's why it dissociates. And so it's, 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 there's nothing wrong with energy conservation or whatsoever. And this is actually quite a well understood in, in circuit creating. This is an, ex, an, an experimental implementation of this Hamiltonian. Of course, many orders of magnitude in the budget here of difference, but um, the, this is a generalized quantum driving model for a two level, um, reson, a two -level system, which is a <coughs> superconducting qubit. And you have one term here proportional to sigma c, which is really diagonal dipole moments that depend on the spin state for the effective spin here. And this sigma x um, is, it can be considered as transition dipole moment contributions. Now, um, um, you can engineer, have either one, the other, or both in a superconducting circuit. We yet don't have this with natural vibrations, but at least we have both, okay? <laughs> That's already good. And, um, and, then, and then the similar, similar they actually measure in this paper, the ground state block trigger shift, and it's significant. Okay, so it's a measurable quantity that I encourage colleagues to try to do similar things with molecules actually, in room temperature. Now I had this um, proposal here to prepare this type of systems, but we don't have time for that. Now the conclusions basically summarize what we have said and um, I will I will leave this in the, um, the will, you can um, pause the YouTube video here to read about it. It's basically the summary of the talk. And I would like to make one final comment if you allow me, Juan, please. Now let's compare the overheads here to do cavity QED with molecules. So this is a, this is a picture from the group of Thomas Everson, which appeared in, the, in, the, in a very well written piece in chemistry world from Katina Kramer. Kramer which basically you put a liquid solution in a cavity and all it takes is to adapt in a clever way. Okay, I'm not minimizing the effort here. It's actually quite complex. Um, a standard equipment, okay, it's standard FTIR equipment um, um, to do the state preparation and everything. Right? So you prepare the solutions outside, you bring them into the cell, you measure chemistry, you measure polariton spectroscopy, and you publish amazing results. Now compare that with this. This is another French pioneer. Okay, so again, uh, Laroche, Laroche, and sorry, and then you put a river atom in, a, in, a, in, in microwave mirrors which are superconducting mirrors with very high Q and compare the other magnitude in the budget. So I think it, it eventually the field will transition into this. Okay, so why not? And um, the reason why we would like to do this is because of state preparation. So you don't, you don't want to uh, only rely on natural chemical processes. You wanna prepare the quantum state of the cavity to target a specific rate. Once we understand what's going on, then we will, people will be able to uh, tailor design these cavities and prepare the molecular species to do um, amazing things in cavity cubing. So with this, I finish one. And um, I would like to thank all our collaborators. We're lucky to have them, um, especially our colleagues in the US and also Canada and Sweden. And, um, we, and I leave this, I'm happy to take questions, but I leave you with references, okay? This would also, you can pause the YouTube video and look this up. So thank you for having me. I'm sorry I went over time and uh, I'm happy to take questions. It, it is no problem. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions. So we'll start with Matt and after that, Professor uh, Dr. Tao Li and after that, Professor Wei Xiang. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I, I would just like to understand better your response uh, regarding the whether the bond lengthening effect will still hold in the collective strong coupling regime. So well, even with all the dark states and the orientational averaging and the fact that the coupling to the cavity to each molecule is super small in the collective regime, may you explain again why you expect the bond lengthening effect to still be experimentally observable? Right, so um, 
we don't have a, we don't have a reason to believe otherwise. So this, this Hamiltonian that we have is, is homogeneous. So all molecules couple equally to light, which is not true. And then, and then we do have the same transition frequencies, which is also not true. And, and yet um, in this particular Hamiltonian, we can um, partition this into many body states for in the many body case, right? We can partition the many body subspace um, according to permutation symmetry. And um, if we only, if we only take into account those um, substates that are fully symmetric with respect to permutation of the of the molecular um, Hamiltonian, of course, right? Because the cavity is no permutation in the cavity there. But if you permute different molecules in the system and you still get the same quantum state, that's totally symmetric. So we can always do that, no matter what the Hamiltonian is, as long as it's homogeneous. And then you can, if you do that, then you can renormalize the parameters for light matter coupling strength and, 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 and change and change what, what you have here, uh, G by square root of NG, whatever appropriate. This is a paper by Frank Spano, by the way, um, from last year. And, and if you ignore the coupling to the rest of the many body states that are non totally symmetric with respect to permutations, then you get the physics that we have here. Now, what couples to the dark states? Of course, everything you ignore, like the, the transition frequencies are not homogeneous and the coupling strengths are not homogeneous in the ensemble. So then you have natural couplings with the reservoir, even without dissipation, even without dissipation, you still have couplings to the, uh, that it mixes permutation symmetry. So, um, and, that, and that, well, that's where the differences will come out. Okay, so we have recent results in this direction, but uh, we're not ready to post yet. And I'm happy to send you more details Mm -hmm. Just okay, let me know. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah uh, hi, this is Tao. I'm not a uh, professor, I'm a graduate student. And my question is it seems that in your formalism, there is no uh, A square term or self polarization term. And many people have known that th these terms can stabilize the molecular ground state. And uh, this the stabilization is proportional to the double moment square. And which, and uh, and in your calculations, it seems that we can get self dissociation. But when we consider this self uh, polarization term, we will also get a self stabilization. Uh, when these two effects are considered together, can we still get the self uh, dissociation of single molecule? So I, I, I don't know about self stabilization, but I'm very glad. So, Tao, thank you for, for asking this question. I actually prepared a slide for that. Um, um, multipolar versus minimal coupling, Hamiltonian. Now, this is a settled question from the 1970s. Somehow it, it percolated into the superconducting circuit literature um, um, in a different way. But um, it's, it, so that triggered, that triggered the response of some of the developers of the theory here, um, a retired professor in, 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 in this very nicely written perspective from JCP two years ago. This is everything here is written in this book. And here are the authors of the book. Um, so Daniel Craig and Thiru Thirunamachandran who developed the theory and did their, they, they work out their careers solving all these issues about uh, self energies, dipole self energies, comparisons between matrix elements in minimal coupling versus multipolar with and without A squared terms. It's all been settled. So, our understanding is that if we have the same um, selection rules and transition um, um, strengths in either, in either um, formalism, then, then we're fine. We also have recent results that um, at least disprove, we think we disprove um, with a counterexample that without including the dipole self energy, somehow the Hamiltonian doesn't have a um, um, well-defined ground state. We found at least one example where this is, uh, is not correct. And, and, and that will be posted soon on archive, hopefully. And um, we're happy to, if you send me your email, I'm happy to share the paper uh, beforehand with you so we can discuss on Zoom anything. 
had um, there is no conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, this is just because uh, we see many papers talking about that without adding this self divergent or a squared term, the ground state is not stable. Uh, for more so there were more, people. sorry to interrupt, there were more papers in the 70s. You think there yeah, are many papers now, but there were more in the 70s. Yeah, I mean, just recent years, uh, Rubio group have a paper talk about if we do not have the a squared term or self divergent, then we have no electronic. Right, so that's. That's what I'm saying that we found a flaw in that argument. Okay. That um, in okay. and and that's uh, so that's what I'm trying to say. So we have one counter example where that argument doesn't hold, and so it's it's not definite. Mm -hmm. Okay, it will be very glad to see this uh, finding. Send me your email okay. and I'll send the preprint. I'm happy to do okay. it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Mm. Professor Weishan, uh, sorry, for, first of all, I would like uh, to ask Professor Felipe Rara, do you have any any concern with the time? Because there is still like four questions. I'm fine. Less. You're fine? Then we can keep yeah. going. Is, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Of course. So uh, we can go with Professor Weishan and after that, Prof uh, Dr. Jorge Campos. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Yeah, so would you mind to go to the, uh, this is a very beautiful talk, um, would you mind to go back to the um, last slide of the spectroscopy part? This. Where you have the, the, the table, uh, this, yeah, this one. So I, I might miss something. Um, so my understanding is uh, in, in the um, ensemble average um, regime, the proton um, manifold become more uh, like a harmonic oscillator. So, um, so from from my understanding that you know all the transitions um, uh, ground state to the first excited state and the uh, first excited to the second excited state and so on and so forth, they would all be the same. So, what are the factors that are missing here so that you can late times the late is the late delays. It's about the delay time. So, um, and that's actually here. This is a very good point, actually, um, which is why our colleagues were so puzzled by all this. So if you look at this picture here, at late and uh, delay times between the pump and the probe, then you do get what you're saying, that the, um, the entire system behaves as couple oscillators with three levels in the material side, right? No equals zero. Uh, so zero to one and, and, and one to two and zero to two, three oscillators. And which could be harmonic and you have a theory that accounts for a small anharmonicity um, and that, that gives you good matching with this spectrum. But, uh, and that's fine. That tells you that the system evolves in, in, in a few tens of picoseconds to something that forgets about uh, this polaritonic um, excited manifolds. And that's fine. That's a, that's a feature that we cannot model at the moment because we, now that we understand the Hamiltonian, the next step is to, is to put this Hamiltonian into a proper master equation and to reproduce dynamics. Of course, that, um, that needs to, you need to think about the role of inhomogeneous disorder here is not sufficient to, um, to take into account Lorentzian uh, decay processes. But it's okay, we're doing it anyway. So, um, the, but at early times is where you see um, departures from that harmonic oscillator picture or expectation that, that you mentioned. Um, so it's, uh, these are polaritonic um, enhanced transmission peaks that are there uh, um, only for a short time. Short meaning that only a few lifetimes, polite and lifetimes. Yeah. So that's why. Sorry, at the early time then, what is, um, so what caused the proton harmonicity at the short time? I'm still a bit confused there. The natural, so this, this is an anharmonic um, uh, NO vibration. So we have a non-zero uh, overtone Trans, um, transition that is relevant in the model. So where, where is the table here? 
So we have um, we have the zero to one. The fundamental transition has a transition dipole moment of 0.39 dy. Now the one to two has a transition dipole moment that's a little bit higher. But and 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 of course the overtone zero to two is ten times weaker than the fundamental. But yet we we need to take it into account. Okay. So all these three transitions, one to zero, zero to two. And, and two to one, they, they are anharmonic spectrally and also in the dipolar sense. They have different dipole moments from the harmonic oscillator picture and they have different energies from the harmonic oscillator picture. So that's why you can take all these anharmonicities dipolar and spectral into account, then you get um, a good agreement with the, with the early time uh, signals, early delay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now Jorge. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can, hello. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was uh, very illuminating. Uh, but I, I have a question. So uh, you highlighted the, the relevance of the permanent dipole moment for, for several of these both softening and bone hardening effects. And uh, some works have shown that uh, once you consider isotropic averaging, uh, the, the permanent dipole moment cannot actually play a role in the collective regime. Do you have any, any comment on this? Right. So isotropic averaging as in gas phase, as in, as in all dipole orientations are equal. Is that what or you mean? In solution. So in solution. So, okay, so there is a, there is a depolarization time for, for dipoles in solution, that is not zero, first of all, right? So if you create a polarization and, 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 and molecules, you measure the response of your molecules over picosecond time scales, you need to compare that with the depolarization times of the vibrational transition. If they are comparable, then they're not isotopically averaged. So if you, if you wait long enough for all the dipole orientations to be um, equivalent, then what you're saying is, is the right thing to do. All right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, now uh, I'm gonna allow uh, Professor Holding Shaw, Professor uh, Frank Hugo, and Professor Stefan Kenakoen to ask questions. Sorry, uh, I, I want to go back to the question about uh, uh, right, well, the, 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 where the dipole increases as a function of uh, internuclear distance and when it decreases. So can, can you just briefly comment outside of the cavity, what are signatures of these properties, spectroscopic signatures? Right. Uh, so in, in IR spectroscopy, you, you don't resolve the sign of the slope here. That's the beauty of... Um, of nature, because it, it hides it from you. So, so, so I in, guess like, my question is, do you, so outside and inside of the cavity, it's not possible to spectroscopically detect this sign? Inside the cavity, we haven't come up with a, with a scheme to do it. I think that would be, a, that's, an, that's an open window here. Mm -hmm. But um, outside the cavity, you can't, because the, the, the strength is, goes like the dipole square. Okay, and okay, and very quickly going back to waste question. Okay, so if you can, you show the the, the energy levels of the in of the up two, lp two, and so on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you have the up transition is at nineteen thirty six, and you and up to up two at nineteen twenty six and nineteen twenty nine. So there are seven wave numbers of difference. So I don't remember exactly the the the, the formulas of these unharmonic shifts, but these seven wave numbers in the collective regime, it doesn't get diluted to almost nothing? Yeah. So you, you need to ask um, Blake here, actually, if how they managed to resolve the congestion. But um, what they explained to me, which I need to parse that, is that these peak positions here, they are the result of the subtraction of the dark response. So they develop these 
to the AR technique where you can subtract at any time, you can subtract the dark um, reservoir response. But, but theoretically, uh, you still get seven wave number difference uh, between the two transitions? So one comes after the other. They, they don't, they don't, um, they are not, the pump comes after the probe, right? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Last so you resolve, you resolve in time, the delays. You resolve the transitions in time. Yeah, but then my question is, theoretically, how do you get that seven wave number? D difference. Oh, I see. I see. So, um, you, get, you have the Hamiltonian with this input, right? So this input is basically to, um, to line up the um, vibrational levels up to n equals two, no equals two, with the cavity states up to n equals two. So you have a triplet with the um, uncoupled energies aligned such that in free space, you would reproduce this. And then, and then what you do is to, uh, you don't know what, that still gives you an un, a free parameter, which is the magnitude of the vacuum amplitude. You don't know what the vacuum amplitude is. You know what the vapor moments are and the energies of the uncoupled states, but you don't know how strong the coupling is at the level of uh, no equals one at the single excitation level. So, and that, and that gives you the vacuum amplitude. So you have to, you have to match you have to match G, basically G over omega, which is basically the vacuum um, and RMS, vacuum field fluctuations you, at this frequency, you match it to, con, um, to coincide as close as possible to this. I see, so theoretically, and you, you make, so, so there's a fitting procedure, okay, that you, that you carry out and it all works. For G, and then the thing is that once you fix, once you fix the dipole, not the dipole, once you fix the vacuum amplitude, it's the same vacuum amplitude for all, for all the manifolds. You don't have different vacuum confinements for different transitions. So that, that's why you, once you have um, all the parameters established after these two steps, then you ask the model to tell you what the frequencies at the higher levels are. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. And now Professor Frank Hu. Mm -hmm. Hey, Philip, nice talk. So can I raise the same concern that Tally raised? Because in all the calculations, you did not include the dipole self-energy. If you don't do that, you break down the gauge invariance between the Coulomb and the dipole gauge. So that's really the concern. If you go back to the, uh, the, the hydrogen fluoride uh, uh, ground state bending uh, result you show, so that slide, yes, slide 28, yeah. So the EGS, the, the new shift you show, which is negative D squared E squared over mix C, that exactly equals to dipole self-energy. So if you, if you include dipole self-energy, they exactly cancel out. And there is no shift in the ground state due to the polarization effect you're, you're suggesting. And in fact, we, we have found similar things a couple of years ago. And, and, and we, we, I believe that if you include dipole self-energy, the bending you see are not going to show up. Instead, what will show up will be uh, how Fox states, what we call the polarized Fox state, how will that you know, associate with different electronic states get more and more non-orthogonal to each other. And that itself has some effect for the, for the, for the ground state reactivities. So I hope you can you can you can reconsider that seriously. And and uh, by the way, this DSE dipole self energy has nothing to do with a square. There are different different quantities, but only when you include dipole self energy, you do have a gauge invariant theory in the dipole in a multipolar uh, gauge. Uh, that that's my comment. Yeah, that remains to be seen. That's my answer. Well, so we think all you show here only include the shift but not the dipole self-energy self. If you do, they cancel exactly and you don't see the shift. So the dipole, the dipole self-energy in the multipolar form is just P squared, right? That's, no, so let's, that's, let's continue the argument, right? Oh, no, because no. We, we had the argument, this discussion before, right? In Frank? the, the multiple and, case, um, you no longer have A squared term, right? Because that's been shifted. You don't have that because you, you have eliminated the, the, the vector potential from the theory. So you only, you only have the polarization density. 
And, and what you call the dipole self-energy in the multipolar formulation, the PCW frame, it's just an integral of P squared. And, um, and oh, that, of course, great. if you, if you only, if you only take, wait, let me finish. I have to, I can answer, right? Can I answer? Absolutely, go ahead. Right, so, um, so if, you, if you have P squared, P, uh, P squared doesn't have the vacuum amplitude in it. P squared is, a, is an operator that only depends on material quantities. Can so I you might as well include it in the electronic Hamiltonian or give corrections to the vibrational spectra. But it has, it is completely independent from the vacuum amplitude. So it, it, it cannot compensate this because this depends on E, e squared, which is the, the square of E zero as the vacuum field fluctuations. But P squared in the multipolar form doesn't even need to, the, the molecule and the cavity to be coupled to begin with. You can have zero transition dipole moments in the material, so you don't couple to it at all. You still will have a P squared term in the multipolar form. So what, where is the cancellation coming from? So it, it, I think it, this, is, this is something that shows up only in the poly first model. But if you, I, I think I, I, I said that here, if you, have, if you have the poly first model, you need to ask the authors here, don't ask me. So why do they observe the same physics? It's really what we're after, right? We wanna describe physics that can be tested experimentally. Why do they um, compute the same physics that we are producing here with a completely different Hamiltonian that does take care of this self dipole square that depends on the vacuum amplitude? You don't need to ask me, you need to ask a different author. But unfortunately, I have to ask you, uh, in the multipolar gauge, there is no A squared term because that's been shifted away by the Porzina Woolley gauge transformation operator. So A squared yeah, I said that. Is not the same. A squared term is not the same as dipole self energy. The reason I understand. Why so I said that. So when, what I'm saying is that what you call the, the, the only dipole self energy that shows up in, in the multipolar form is just the integral of the polarization density squared. That's which it, exactly, that's no dependence. Which exactly equals to the term you show. But I, don't, I disagree with that. You need to prove it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is of course a very interesting discussion, but as Professor Frank and Cohen are still waiting to ask a question, we're already short on time. So I encourage you to continue the discussion, of course, uh, later after the meeting, if we can do that. So, Professor Stefan, can I, can you can unmute yourself? Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the interruption. Can you hear me, Philippe? No problem. Yeah. Hi, Stefan. Hi. Uh, so, great talk. Uh, I have a, a quick question about the same spectroscopy slide that um, Wei and Well asked about. So, what I don't quite see here is why you can also um, ignore a dark state to LP2 and UP2 transitions when looking at the peaks that are observed. Yeah. So the, in, in this, okay, I actually need to go back to the other slide. This is uh, projected here. Okay, so here you have two, this is the entire 2D spectra and here you have slices at different pump frequencies. Okay, so here you pump the blue line here, you pump at the UP. Okay, so that's already at least 20 wave numbers away from the dark manifold and uh, from the reservoir states of B equals one. So you don't, uh, they compute it, I don't compute. So you have a, a, only a small response in this, in this pump, in this probe regime, they have only a small contribution from the dark manifold. And whatever contribution they have here from the very resonances, they subtract it. Because they, in this, in this reference, they prove that um, they have a characteristic time scale that can be understood analytically. So you can subtract it from these um, pro, uh, this, uh, slice, spectral slices at, um, at different LP and UP frequencies. And that's why you can, you can compare on equal footing with the model. The model the, uh, disregards the dark reservoirs as a simplification, just to see what's going on. And, and, and they have this procedure to subtract the dark response to really have a, a reasonable ma uh, comparison between theory and experiment. So off the Does top that of your answer head, the question? 
Yeah, so, so I, I guess it's a time scale argument and they're able to remove that. Do you have an idea in this system? Um, I guess it's not your experiment, but when you pump, for example, the UP uh, in this disordered system, how quickly do dark states uh, get populated? Um, well, uh, at least, at least um, from 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 this work, I think how quickly in picoseconds. I think already at ten, um, ten to twenty picoseconds, then um, all this population in the excited polariton in many folds is already gone. Yeah, so they, they take the long time response and, and remove that. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, that was actually the last question. So uh, thank you again, Professor Felipe Pereira, uh, not only for, for giving a wonderful presentation, but also for taking the time to answer all these questions. And I'm pretty sure if there is some other questions people still have. So I encourage them to type the question in the Q&A section, and maybe we can refer those questions to Professor Felipe Pereira afterwards. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, so this is it for today's uh, Polariton, Semi uh, Polariton Chemistry webinar. And next week, uh, we will have uh, a second webinar of 2021. Uh, we'll be hosting Professor Marina Litinskaya from University of British Columbia. We will be sharing the information about the presentation, the abstract and the title uh, as soon as possible. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, again. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Thank and you, everyone. Thank you, for the everyone. Uh, have a good rest of the week.